So now it's time for, for me to uh, introduce Professor uh, Mark Horowitz, who will be providing a distinguished talk entitled Be Curious, Be Bold, But Really Do Listen to Others. So I'll have a brief bio of Prof. Mark Horowitz. Uh, everyone knows uh, the bio is very long, but I shortened it so we can read it in time. So Professor Mark Horowitz received bachelor's and master's in, in electrical engineering from MIT in 1978 and his PhD from Stanford in 1984. Since 1984, he has been a professor at Stanford, working in the area of digital integrated circuit design. And while at Stanford, he had a led a number of processor designs, including MIPS-X, one of the first processors, to include on-chip instruction cache, a torch, a statistically scheduled superscalar processor, flash, a flexible DSM machine, and SMASH, a reconfigurable polymorphic many-core processor. And he also worked in a number of other chip design areas, including high-speed links, high-speed memory design, high bandwidth interfaces, and fast floating point. Okay, and in 2000s, he started a long collaboration with Prof. Livoy in computational photography, where he included the work that led to literal camera, whose photo photographs Photographs could be refocused after they were captured. This was a groundbreaking finding. And Dr. Horowitz's current research interests are quite broad and span using EE and CS analysis method to problems in neural and molecular biology to creating new agile design methodologies in analog and PLSI design circuits. So without further ado, it was shortened but already very long. Uh, Professor Mark Horowitz, please. Okay, um, I hopefully in the next 15 minutes will convince you that you should be curious. You should wonder about just the world around you and go into things that you didn't necessarily plan to do initially and be bold. Stick your neck out a little bit more than maybe it feels comfortable. But while you're doing that, still pay attention to what other people say. I'm not saying you have to follow their advice, but you should listen and carefully think about it. So another way of saying this is I really am trying to tell you the advantages of being episodically overconfident. If you're completely overconfident, know that you know everything, that's not so good because you don't listen to anybody and you're going to fall on your face. But if you have no confidence, then you're not going to take any risks. And, and you know, everybody knows that learning comes from failure. And so to fail, you actually have to take some risks. Okay, as a kid, I learned, not quickly enough for some of my friends, that throwing things against the ground was a good way of maybe getting inside it, but it was not a good way if I ever wanted to put that thing back together. Okay. And I also learned that if you're going to break something, it pays to take something apart that's already broken because they're also less upset at you when you do that. So be bold, but you know, think a little bit about ramifications a little bit. Um, and the reason this is important is because learning comes from failure. Uh, when I was a kid, there were mechanical watches. And I remember taking apart a zillion mechanical watches. Some of them are pictured here. You'll notice they're missing hands and other pieces. Because most of the watches I took apart, I didn't really put back together. Um, and I have a long story about the first watch I took apart where I knew what I was doing and I was trying to be really careful. But I forgot about this thing called a mainspring. And so when I loosened all the screws enough, the mainspring unsprung and threw everything over my kitchen. And I never found some of the gears. Um, but through that process, I came to my first epiphany, which was if somebody puts something together, and that's either physical or, or you know, virtual, there has to be a way to take it apart. I, I learned all the different ways you can hide screws, okay, plastic snaps. And I also learned that glue is actually expensive in a manufacturing process. So even though you think everything's glued together, very few things actually are. And through this process, I learned kind of my first act of boldness, which is if you read a sign that says, caution, do not open, listen to it, be a little careful, but that doesn't mean you can't open it, right? I remember when I was a kid, there were tubes that were going out of style and transistor stuff were going in style. Tubes 
didn't tell you not to open because you had to open because you had to replace the tubes. Transistor stuff said not open. Like in tubes, there's 150 volts in there. That's way more dangerous than the like the 10, 20 volts that were in the transistor stuff. So think, pay attention, but do what you think is right. Okay, after taking a bunch of things apart, I learned that, you know, and I was curious. So I always wondered what would happen if, right? So that might look to you like a mailing tube. This might look like a mailing tube. And I was wondering what would happen if you have this tube and you kind of stretch it out. You know, I knew a little bit about air pressure. And if you pull it down, right? Well, that wasn't very exciting. You know, air pressure did push it off, but that was not really the best I could do. So I wondered what would happen if I kind of held it on while I was compressing it. And basically, I learned the following. <laughs> that was. <laughs> I meant to bump it off the top, not go in. That was like excellent aim, but I didn't intend. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I did that in my mom's living room. It hit the ceiling really long. My mom came down and told me never to do that inside the house again. Um, Anyhow, so I, I learned there was advantages to being curious and trying things out, right? Um, the next thing I tried out was to build a radio, because if you're interested in electronics in the 60s, that's what you did. But I lived in this blue area, oops. I lived in this blue area over here, and right next to me, less than a mile away, was WTOP, which was a 50,000 watt clear AM station, 106 on your AM dial, which is 1.6 megahertz. And you know, any radio I built, I could get WTOP. I could put an earphone in my ear and hold the end of the earphone and get WTOP. But I couldn't get anything but WTOP. So it was not that interesting to build radios for me. So I moved on and was interested in digital stuff. And, and what happened was, this is where my episodic overconfidence came in. I would end up being bored. I would read about some new thing, get really excited, badger whoever it was that could pay for it, to let me do it, okay? Finally, they would agree just to get me out of their hair. This was the overconfident phase. Then, once they said yes, I went, oh shit, what did I just do? And I procrastinated for a long time because I was so convinced that it wouldn't work and I didn't want to be embarrassed until I was so embarrassed about not doing anything after I said I could do it that I started building it and I very quickly tried to build it to debug it because I knew there would be bugs in it, okay? And usually I was successful in getting it working, sometimes not, but we won't talk about those things. And then I became bore again, bored again. You know, just to prove to you that I'm not joshing, I found out my application to MIT. Now, I drew a circuit because I thought I had figured out a better way to build a full adder. Now, you probably don't even understand what bipolar transistors are, so don't try to analyze the circuit. But the point is, I built it, it worked. But what I didn't realize is it degrades the output signal at each stage. So while I built the stage and it worked, it, the circuit's really not good. Now, either the people at MIT were sympathetic and thought, oh, this is a kid who, you know, but he, he's, he's old, you know, or they didn't actually understand circuits either because it doesn't work at all. But they, they, they still got in, which was a good thing. The problem was, that I wanted to go to MIT, and my mom said I could go to any college I wanted, but she was going to play, pay for the University of Maryland. We didn't have a lot of money. Um, so I needed a summer job, and I was very lucky. I got a summer job at the National Bureau of Standards, which is now um, NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology. Um, I had done lifeguarding before, and I was not a good lifeguarder and didn't want to do that. So I was very good. I was very lucky to get this, lot, this job at a uh, lab tech at Bureau of Standards. Um, during the four years that I worked there when I was going to MIT, I built a ton of instruments and controllers. What's interesting when I look back at those, they all could have been built by an Arduino today. A little software in an Arduino probably could do all of them. But Arduinos didn't exist back in the, in the 70s. I learned a ton about noise and measurements. I ended up measuring parameters to six figures, which if you wanna, you know, wanna talk to me, it's actually pretty tough um, to get anything that's good to six places. I, we ended up controlling temperatures to microkelvin. Um, but mostly what happened is I built my confidence that I could do things. Um, 
And you know that little circle? I don't know how many times I did this. You know, I would say, oh, I'm gonna build the digital filter. I had no idea what a digital filter was, but I thought it was cool. You know, I built it, it worked. And then like a year later, I learned in, at MIT how cir digital circuits work and I went and God was smiling at me because I had this race that could have broken the circuit, but you know, it went in my favor. So one of the things I learned in this job is that, you know, they had a list of things for me to do. And if I just did those things, I would have done and I would have been bored spitless, right? So what I did is I actually talked to people about what they were doing, tried to figure out if I could do something that might help them, okay? And what I learned is it's way better to always think about the bigger picture, to see if there's a better approach, to see if there's something that you could do that might help them because they like being helped, okay? But the trick is, don't screw up your main task either because that's gonna wreck all your options. So do what they expect of you, but always be looking at the bigger picture. Always learn, be curious about the world so that you learn a little bit more so in your next job or task, you're a little bit more capable than you were when you walked in. So it's okay, it's actually even good to learn on the job and you should try really hard to do that. Um, my experience building things that the Bureau of Standards really changed me. I was an extremely unusual MIT student. Most students, when they take a class, you know, the faculty member says this is useful, but, but the students say, like, R's and C's and ohms, like, what is this crap, right? Why is this ever going to be useful? For me, I had been trying to build these circuits. You know, I saw them in some magazine, and I was building them, and I had no idea why they were working. And, like, someone just handed me the keys to the kingdom. I now could analyze those circuits and understand why they worked. So I was paying way more attention than all my colleagues. And I tell you, when you pay attention, you learn a lot more. And so I benefited more from my classes than I think my, my, my co-students did. The other thing that I did is I like being curious. I like understanding how things work. So most people, when they did homework, you know, they do the homework, and when they get the answer, they're so glad they got the answer, they'd be done. But me, I hate busy work. I hate grinding through things. I'm not very good at it. I'm not very careful. So if I ground through a problem and got a really simple answer, I would go, wow, I bet there's an easier way to get that answer than all this algebra I just did. And I would spend enormous amounts of time, aka, I was a total nerd, trying to figure out how to find a simpler solution to the problem. So homework became a game to me to find the shortest solution that you could, and then on my homework solution, write that really short solution. Um, but as a process, as a result of that, I learned a bunch of tricks. So people now think I'm really smart. I'm not really smart. I'm really lazy. I just have been practicing being lazy for a very long time. Okay, so I, I end up ending up, I'm a faculty member, right? You heard. Well, how did I get a faculty member? How did I become a faculty member? I had a job. The company that I worked in was Signetics. None of you have heard about it because it was a horrible company. Um, I met Bob Dutton, who was, who was at Signetics um, cons Consulting. He suggested I apply to Stanford. You know, I thought MIT was fun. You know, I, you know, I like school. I didn't want to move, I hate moving. And you know, Stanford was right close in Silicon Valley. So I became a PhD student, you know. This was really strategic. I'm, I'm trying to tell you that you don't, everything in your life doesn't have to be strategic. I was curious, I took advantage of opportunities. You know, there's an opportunity, it seemed interesting. Why not try? Okay, I'm a PhD student. I'm working on basically CAD tools for integrated circuit design with Bob. Um, I focused on resistance extraction. I wrote some early papers on resistance extraction. I was bored, I didn't really like the topic very much. I didn't have that much insight. Someone asked me a question about timing in MOS circuits. Um, they thought it was hard. I thought the problem was relatively easy. So I switched thesis topics halfway through my PhD. Another thing that people probably don't recommend. But the point is, you know, be bold. Take some risks. If what you're doing isn't good, try something else. Um, and then in the timing, in, in the area of, of, of CMOS timing, um, there was this, this seminal paper that was done by um, Paul Penfield and Hori Rubenstein that I was trying to extend, and I couldn't understand how they did some steps. Anyhow, I talked to Paul. Um, he's a, he was a very lovely man. Um, and we worked together and got some, you know, furthered his research. Um, and what happened in that is I thought I invented something. And then I told it to Paul. And Paul came back and he told me that he bested what I did. Like, like he wasn't, like, 
I didn't think it was arrogant for me, a stupid student, to tell a fancy MIT professor that I did something better than him. But when a fancy MIT professor said that he did something better than me, I was offended. Right? Okay, but so he said he invented something, and then when he told me what he invented, it seemed like stuff that I kind of knew a little bit already. Um, but Paul is such a sweet and wonderful guy. I realized he did invent it, because I didn't say everything I was thinking. He came up with it. And to argue about who invented anything is like the biggest waste of time. So my third epiphany was there's a huge advantage of trusting people. Most people are really good. And two people can independently invent something. And if you spend a lot of time arguing or being careful not to say anything to anybody so they don't steal it, what you will find is you will not reap the benefits of the community. And that there are some people who are basically not nice. They are not very prevalent in all the communities I've worked in. And when you run into them, they will take advantage of you and you will just never work with them again. But don't not work with other people because there was one bad person, because that's just cutting your nose off despite your face or whatever that expression is. OK. So now I'm happy with my research. Um, a, a colleague of mine goes to work at another dead company called Digital Equipment Corporation. Um, he suggests to them that I could teach a VLSI class because I was interested in VLSI and thought that I would, might be good. Deck invites me to go out to basically be a TA for a class that um, Chuck Seitz is going to teach, and I thought Chuck Seitz was an amazing guy. Um, and then they get talk to other people who have higher titles than I do, I guess, or something, or I did because I was a student, and they uninvite me. They said, you know, I know we said that you could come out, but, you know, we found better people. We don't, you don't need to come out. Okay. So this is the other thing that I think I, you know, be bold. I decide to go anyway. Like, I, I really thought, you know, TAing for Chuck would be good. I, I, I was going to visit my mom because I'm on the West Coast. She's on the East Coast. And I, so I called them up and said, you know, if you don't pay me, can I come anyhow? And they probably didn't want me there. But, you know, maybe they're feeling a little guilty. So, so, but they said yes. Okay, so I went. Okay, it turns out I went there, I hit it off really well with Chuck, um, and I got the next gig. So, you know, don't overthink what other people are thinking, right? They said no, don't think that they think you're a horrible, miserable person or whatever you're thinking, just think that they said no, right? And if you wanna go anyhow or you're willing to do something, just ask, you know, the worst thing they can say is say no. And then you're no worse off than if you hadn't asked. So this is my students hate when I say this because I say it a lot. Don't make decisions for other people. If you think they're not going to want you to do it, but you want to do it, ask them. Force them to say no. Anyhow, I ended up teaching the class. Back then, nobody had YouTube. Nobody had any videos. I watched myself on the video, and I was a horrible speaker. I had so many speech ticks. It was awful. But the funny thing was, I kind of liked being on stage, which for me was really surprising because I'm a total introvert. I, I avoided people, and I still avoid people mostly. Um, so I decided that maybe I should become a faculty member. Okay, I joined Stanford and facu on faculty in 1984. That year, all the VLSI faculty leave to start a company. John Hennessy, who was the person teaching computer architecture in VLSI, leaves to start MIPS computer systems. I end up running John's DARPA, large DARPA grant, you know, got 10, 15 students. Um, this is the MIPSX project that was mentioned. And I'm a student, you know, how do you manage people? You just work. So I designed part of the chip, you know, the only way I got, you know, I was just in school, I was in my office longer than everybody else was, you know, so I guess maybe people felt guilty. I knew nothing about delegation or any of that stuff. So, if I don't die, it will be a good experience. I didn't die, it was a good experience, but I wouldn't recommend it. After six years at Stanford, I was getting bored again, and I met Mark, Mike Frommold consulting at MIPS Computer Systems. Mike talked about this performance gap that was gonna happen, this was back in 1990, where we could see that processors were increasing in performance dramatically, but memory was not. Worse yet, 
the number of DRAM chips on each processor was going down, which meant that the bandwidth to that memory chip was gonna be a real issue. And so he wanted to start a company, which I thought was totally a stupid idea, because DRAMs were commodity products, so I could tell him to tell you. Know. But anyhow, he convinced some VCs to give him money, and so I felt really stupid, again, saying why people would be a bis bad business idea when business people were giving money. So I, I ended up joining him, and we formed Rambus. Um, and it was my only experience in sales. Uh, that was between 1990 and 1991. Mike and I hit the road, and we were trying to convince DRAM manufacturers to license this technology. We were called crazy multiple times because we were making DRAMs more complicated, and everybody knew that was wrong because DRAMs had to be cheap, and they had to be as simple as possible. But they had to be more complicated if we're going to increase the bandwidth by over 10x. So my fourth epiphany was that what you believe really does change the future. You know, I'd heard this many times, and I thought this was so cycle babble mumbo jumbo, and I just didn't believe any of it. I'm an engineer. Things are what they are, right? The problem is that it's not metaphysical. What we believed changed what we did. And the fact that we believed we could do this and went out and talked to a whole bunch of people to tell them that we could do it changed what happened in the world. And so when we told the companies that this is the best thing since sliced bread, kind of made me a little uncomfortable because it wasn't necessarily true. It would be true if we convinced them it was true. And if we didn't convince them, it wouldn't be true. Right? So how successful we were would change the future. And I've noticed this in my students in my class too. If you believe you can understand the material, then when things go badly, you continue working on it and you will understand. If you believe you can't understand the material, when things go badly, it just confirms to you that you can't understand the material and you stop working. Right? So it is really true that what you believe affects what you do and therefore affects the, the future. So since returning to Stanford after Rambus, I continue to be curious. I continue to be taking advantage of interesting opportunities. I am not a planner. I don't have a long-term planning horizon. What I do is I do things. I'm curious. I stick my nose in places it doesn't belong. And when I find opportunities, I try to pursue them. And you know, sticking my nose in places it doesn't belong requires me to be a little bold, maybe a little arrogant. So in summary, I think you really need to be curious. There is a tremendous advantage to being willing to look at and learn about parts of the world that you don't quite understand. It's also really important that you believe in yourself because it really does change outcomes because it allows you to take on tasks that maybe you wouldn't take. But please do listen to feedback, right? When people say the idea is crazy, listen to everything that they say and listen to all the reasons they say it's crazy. Like, if you know all those things, right, and you have answers for them, great. Continue to do what you, you're doing. If they raise a point that you hadn't thought about, for damn sure, please think about that point and understand whether they're right or not and then try to adjust strategy. Okay? Thank you all for your attention.